if you test positive, you have COVID. Right. Simple it's, statement. Yeah. So <laughs> this is this is how I arrived in in looking at all of this stuff because I'm a diagnostician, right? Testing's mm. my area, and um, and I saw that there was a problem back in summer 2020 with the testing, and you know, medical tests are imperfect. They're pretty good, but they're all imperfect in their own way, and that's why you know, we have doctors and it's why we have diagnostic experts within medicine as well, because otherwise everyone could just go and get tested and they'd know what was going on, right? So it's critical when you're testing that, first of all, you understand the likelihood of somebody having the problem in the first place. So for example, if you do prostate cancer tests on old men, then, and you find some positives, well, you might want to go and find out, you know, go a bit further, do biopsies, see if they've actually got it. If you do that same test on a bunch of schoolboys, you'll know that all of the positives are errors. So, you know, it really matters what population you're testing in the first place. So you have to be sensible about who you're going to test. Um, and then when you do test, you have to have a test that's going to give you a meaningful answer. So the meaningful answer we wanted in this situation was one of two different things, actually. There are two scenarios when you test. One is to say, is this sick person infected with COVID? Is it, is it COVID make, that is making them sick? And that's a separate question, which would require a slightly different type of testing. Yeah. And the other type of testing is, is this person infectious? Those mm. are the two questions. And the way the testing was set up, it didn't answer that last one. It was set up so that it would say positive yeah. on the basis of three to four viral particles in the sample that was tested. Now, you can get three to four virus particles in a single aerosol in the air or a single aerosol in the lab, and then a, that sample could get contaminated and could come back as a positive. So that was a, that was a really crazy way to set it up. But, I mean, I have some sympathy for uh, when you're setting up a new test yeah. for, you know, going to the wrong extreme, right? So, you know, as in... At the beginning, when we didn't know so much about what was going on and you wanted a test to find possible cases in a country where you thought there wasn't any disease yet, then you might set it up to find anything, right? Anything. We just want a test that's going to pick anything up. But as soon as that's not the situation anymore, you have to adjust how you test it. That's the thing. So I, kind of, I will forgive them for how they set it up, yeah. but not for not adjusting it afterwards. And it's, but even then, the idea that three viral particles is going to indicate that you are infected, infectious, and therefore need to be quarantined for however long period of time does seem a bit extreme. But um, It is extreme. And I think one of the massive problems here is the word infection, which mm. doesn't have a proper definition. And it's just so limiting. People use it to mean different things. So, you know, uh, if, you've, if you've got, uh, you know, if a virus is causing you to be ill, I think everyone can agree that's an infection. Yeah. If a virus is replicated in your cells, but your immune system has dealt with it and you never have a symptom, shouldn't we give that a different word, right? That needs a different name. Yeah. If the virus is replicated in your cells, um, or, or sorry, if your virus has entered, but your immune system's dealt with it before it ever entered a cell. Is that an infection? It was in your lung. Is that an infection? If it enters your airway but never gets past the mucus layer, is that an infection? Well, I, I would say it. not. I would, I say, would not. say not, but it was being yeah. treated as if it was. So that's yeah. the fundamental problem is that people who had it in their airway were being called infected. And what that meant was that hospital testing was really distorted and intensive care testing was really distorted because you've got a virus in the air in an intensive care unit. And so, you know, if you're just repeatedly, often repeatedly testing these people, that's the other problem, that people were tested until it was positive. And every negative before then was ignored as if that was the mistake. The single positive was treated as the ultimate truth. Yeah, people. I mean, intensive care units are generally one big room in hospitals. And uh, if there was one infected patient or one infected member of staff, that would be enough to have three or four viral particles, I would have said, in the respiratory mucosa of every patient and member of staff in, the, in that room. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And what's really like, scandalous about this is that the, 
the original PCR protocol, and obviously people designed their own protocols, but this was an important protocol because it was the first one back in January 2020, written up by Christian Drosten, who's a sort of, he's a virologist in um, Germany, but he's a, you know, he was their sort of go-to science guy throughout the whole pandemic. Um, and he also ran a massive lab. So he had conflicts of interest right there. And then but there's all sorts of conflicts, to be honest. And he, um, he designed this test in a manner that was, was not conducive to accurate reporting. You know, it was everything was sort of set up to be, to produce as many positives as possible, yeah. essentially. Um, and then he got this paper published within 24 hours. You know, so there's no peer review process just turned around like that and then and there it was and even more ridiculously one of the companies producing these tests had already started shipping like before this paper was out it was you know it, they were shipping test kits almost before the sequence had come out of china it's all i mean it's all very very ridiculous but the point being that he had commented in an interview about what happened with MERS. So do you remember back in 2013? Yeah, yep. uh, Middle, uh, oh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, 2009. Yep. Yeah, with camels meant to have been the source of the virus, and it was mainly a problem in Saudi Arabia. It, yep. it didn't really go global. And he was very critical about the way they were testing it, about how the media had hyped it up into this massive thing. And he says how... If they were testing a nurse who was on in the ward and had breathed in the air in the ward, you might swipe some virus from the, on the surface of the mucus and then say that she's positive when she's never going to develop a symptom, never be infectious to anyone else. So he absolutely knew the problems with testing in the manner that he was then advocating for. Yes, and, and, and people were testing positive for like weeks, weren't they? Um... Absolutely. This was, this was a massive problem that was... Focused on in summer 2020, people were, were people like Carl Hennigan, who's the central director, the director of evidence based medicine in Oxford. He was really influential, actually, in making this problem go away. But there was an awful problem where people who had had an infection would keep testing positive for literally months afterwards. Yes. Yeah. And the official line was, well, that can't be true because, um, you know, RNA viruses don't hang around. RNA doesn't hang around naturally. So it can't be true. If they've positive for RNA, they must have got infected again and they need to be isolated and we need to carry on assuming this is real. Um, and it wasn't real. And the, in retrospect, what we know is that the viral RNA was in a proportion of people ending up in the DNA of the cells of their respiratory tract. And then what they were essentially waiting months for were those cells to die. They were literally waiting for the cell to die before they were going to test negative. And eventually that was accepted. And the NHS said, well, if you are a staff member and you've been infected, you mustn't test for 90 days. It started to become don't test mm -hmm. for 90 days because it will just come back positive. But this situation was ruining people's lives. So the yeah. story of um, three young British lads who went in summer 2020 to Italy to teach English. And they ended up in an isolation in Florence where they were sort of down a corridor from each other and they could message each other on their phones, but they only ever got to see each other when they were being tested again. And they'd get tested again and all three of them kept coming back positive. I don't know if it really was the situation that they were all positive or whether somebody was, you know, the person doing the testing was breathing out all over the swabs or something because you think, why is it all three of them every single time? And they, they were stuck there for a ridiculous length of time. I think it was... In prison might be another way to put it. Absolutely. In prison would be another way to put it. And they finally, the, the, in the end, they were only released by a sort of change of the rules. They said, well, if you haven't had symptoms for this long and you've had one negative at some point, then that will do or something. And they let them out. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, fiddled, they, they, they fiddled it so they could release yeah, them. Yeah, I think they got you know. bored of them after a while um, and released them. And they managed to make it back into the UK literally days before a situation where they'd have been forced to isolate because you know, it was just ridiculous. It was awful. They were treated really, really badly. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, at, the, at the time, Claire, I, I, we were sort of told that people were testing positive for weeks or months because there were small RNA viral residues in cells. Uh, these cells were being replaced and basically sloughing off. 
into you know because cells are being replaced all the time and it was these that were these these very small amounts of uh, rna residue that was being detected but what you're saying is um no there was actually reverse transcriptase well i think that is what actually was happening here so people kept talking about rna debris didn't they there were yes yeah that's that's what i believed until just this conversation yeah, and maybe well, maybe it was a bit of both it might well have been a bit of both but i think what's important was the point you raised last time about the testing which is that when you've got an rna sequence then when you are designing a test to say you know is this a virus you don't want to see bits of rna so it's really important that you include testing um that you're testing for parts of the virus from one end to the very other end and at the other end were the bits of the virus that had the replication sort of components because you want to know that it's able to replicate otherwise it's it's meaningless it's not oh it's, it's irrelevant if it can't replicate yeah. it doesn't matter yeah but the just, test was designed to have just um just test for parts of the sequence only at one end and it's at the wrong end so if you're going to test only at one end you want to test at the far end so you've had to you know you have to go all the way along the sequence you get to the far end okay we've got that bit there so that means that you know we must have had all the bit along the way is it nobody would design a test like that? You it's like testing for toenail it. clippings, and if you find toenail clippings, it means they're people. It is exactly like <laughs> it's exactly like that. Or it's like the sort of you know you go into sort of forensic DNA at some kind of crime scene, and you think you've caught them red-handed. Like they're not there. They're not there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, last question, uh, Claire. Uh, P PCR was taken as the gold standard. Were, were there alternative testing tests that could have been used that that humans know about? So, um, I, I think PCR as a first test makes a lot of sense, right? It right. makes sense because we've got labs that can very easily switch what they're testing for. Yeah. And so, they, you know, you've got the PCR, you've got the setup, you've got the staff, you just switch in the different sequence and you can get a test up and running very, very fast. Yeah. So, the test that you want to use is the protein test, you know, the kind of the sort of plastic lateral flow test that, mm. that came out from about summer 2020. And so from summer 2020, we should have really just moved to using those. At yeah. least if, you've, if you are sick in the community, I think that would have been a sensible go-to test to use. But the sensible go-to test to use in a hospital that never got used, despite the government having enormous capacity to use it, was antibody testing. Yes. So the thing is that by the time you're arriving in hospital, almost always, unless you're very frail, almost always, you've had over a week at home sick already. Be at antibodies. that point, you've got antibodies. And you could do the antibody test and you could tell from the antibody test whether this was an acute or an old infection. And, and a different would, type of immunoglobulins would change. Yeah, profile and you wouldn't have any of this nonsense about, is it just something I just breathe in because I'm standing in a hospital? You'd know what was going on in that yeah. patient specifically. And it was yeah. just never done. It would have been so easy if there's IgMs, it's a new infection. If there's yeah. IgGs, it's been there for a few days or a week. Yeah, and also you get so an easy at to the do. bedside. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could just do it there, there and then. Yeah, but it, incredible. Wasn't used. it was never used. Yeah. So fair to say that PCR gave a few false positives. Um, yeah, I think that is fair to say. Now, at one <laughs> point, I was very loud about this. And, you know, we were saying about the politicisation of science. This was the point at which I was not being heard and I was shouting louder and I started to exaggerate, I think. So I was saying that there were... That there, Just that pure, frustra pure frustration of not being heard. Um, yeah, I think it was, but it's not an excuse. You know, I do regret having done it. I did get it wrong. And um, I, was, I was concerned that in autumn 2020, I was concerned that essentially we were chasing our tails and that almost all the positives were false positives. And actually, I could still make that case very strongly for you, given other clinical data, you know, who's coming into A&E, how many people are seeing their doctors with a cough. All those sort of data points were saying nothing was going on. And it was just the testing that was creating this illusion of something really major going on. Um, but by the winter, you know, I think we did have COVID that winter. I think yes. there yeah, we absolutely did. was COVID around. And when you look back at the whole sort of trajectory of a wave, then actually the number of people in the community with symptoms who tested positive was a pretty neat match for the number that then developed antibodies when you test blood donors randomly. So I think that overall, the community PCR testing was finding 
most of the people who were sick with COVID. And so, you know, I think that the problem lay in hospitals swabbing people who were dying or dead, because at that point, you're not fighting off virus, so you can test positive, <laughs> and asymptomatic people. I think those are the, where the false positive problem was largest. Um, and of course, the thing is, I don't think you need to test an entire community with PCR over the course of anything. That's a massive waste of money. And there, I haven't yet met somebody who said to me, I think I had COVID, my test was positive, but I wouldn't have known otherwise. Like everybody I've met knows they had COVID yeah. because of their illness. And if it wasn't their illness, it was the illness of their partner or someone yeah. else who'd been there at the time that was just so characteristic. You know, it was a slightly, it, I think it was characteristic. I, I have arguments with people who don't think it was, but I think it was characteristic enough. It lasted a lot longer than other infections. It there's, there's a qualitative component, isn't it, that people yeah. know they felt different to other infections that they've had. Yeah, and there were some slightly weird symptoms associated with it. So one of the symptoms I had that I thought was really strange was eye pain when I looked sideways. That was a really odd symptom. Anyway, I mean, I, and then there's, of course, there's the loss of smell thing. People are like, yeah, people always lost their smell with cold. So like, they didn't lose their smell for months. That's new. Yeah, so but when you look at it like that, you think, well, why did we have any testing at all? If people know, then why, why did we do all that? Why did we spend all that money? Yeah, the, the, it's the, the, the demigration of, of clinical diagnosis, really. Mm, mm, absolutely. And yeah. actually, that was critical, wasn't it? Because in the past, um, you know, if you were going to come up with a new diagnosis, you produce a sort of a, a list of symptoms that you think are characteristic of a syndrome. And then based on your understanding of this syndrome, you start to try to think about the molecular biology, yes. and come up with a test for it and see if you can find a test that will tell us more about what's going on here. But Once you've identified a problem in the real world, in the real clinical world. Yes, exactly. That will just help clarify for an individual yeah. whether they're part of that group or not. Yeah. But with this, it was completely inverted. So instead of a cluster of symptoms, being the critical information with the test as icing on the cake, the test was it. If you were positive for that test, that was your answer. And of course, when that's inverted, the a ridiculous thing happens where people who've got a positive test might have any, any and all sorts of symptoms, and then they all get attributed to being COVID just because they had a positive test when they had that symptom. And then you get the situation of, well, I haven't got any symptoms at all. And then that counts as well. Because, that counts as asymptomatic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which um, we're not going to get round to on this video. Um, but um, if uh, Dr. Craig agrees, we can do that on a future video. So you're going to have to stay tuned for that one. But we've covered uh, quite a few beliefs there, Claire. So thank you very much. Thank so, uh, so it's great to have someone with your um, expertise and. Uh, who's followed this so with such a dedicated uh, amount of time and effort over over the entire course of the pandemic it does make sense get get the book you won't regret it and uh, well, i think you've got a substack as well claire have you i do have a substack yeah dr claire craig i am on substack and i i don't post on it as regularly as some people do but i'll i'll put little pieces on now and again yeah we'll, um, we'll put we'll put the link on for sure okay yeah thanks. great Claire, th thank you so much. Um, uh, it's an hour and 20 minutes. I'm actually quite tired now. It's, it's pure concentration. So, <laughs> really, but it's fa fantastic stuff. It, and it's so, I just feel it's so important to get this documented now. And, um, uh, and that's what we've done. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, John. See you next time.